Welcome to Worship at St. Paul's. Please join me this morning in singing hymn 448. be with you and also with you let us pray almighty and everlasting God you govern all things both in heaven and on earth mercifully hear the supplications of your people and in our time grant us your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever amen We gather in your name, Jesus, because we know who you are. You know our deepest needs and weaknesses, and we look to you in hope. Hear our prayers, Holy One of God. The world is hurting and restless for you, Lord. The earth is stressed and cries out for protection. Its peoples cry out in hunger and fear, we turn to you in need of deliverance. Hear our prayers, Holy One of God. We pray for your church as it walks your way of life. May your people and their leaders know deeply your loving, liberating, life-giving presence. Hear our prayers. Holy One of God. We pray for those who govern all over the world, that they may pursue justice and practice peace. Equip them with the courage and resources to respond to the needs of their people. Hear our prayers, 
Holy One of God. For those who have lost their freedom to addiction, for those who wrestle with worry, for those who struggle with mobility, communication, and relationships, for those who are ill and facing surgery or treatments, for those who will soon give birth, and those who have lost a pregnancy. We look to you for care of all these to give them hope through your presence. Hear our prayers, Holy One of God. We commend to you the souls of those who have died and ask you to comfort those whose hearts ache with grief. Hear our prayers, Holy Holy One One of God. God. Hasten, O Father, the coming of your kingdom, and grant that we, your servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold your Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? a new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Part three of our baptism series focuses on the first three of a set of questions that the priest asks the baptismal candidates and any parents and godparents following their presentation. 
These three questions have one word and concept in common among them. Renouncing. It's not a word that is used frequently in common speech, and yet renouncing features prominently in these three questions that deal with turning away from the influence of evil spiritual forces on our lives. What does it mean to renounce Satan and the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? Or to renounce the evil powers of this world that corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? Or to renounce all sinful desires that draw us from the love of God? It may be helpful to first look at the root of the word renounce. Before John Milton created modifiers for existing words to indicate their negative opposite, words like unprincipled, unaccountable, irresponsible, before all that, there were fewer ways to express the intention behind an action like renouncing. The term renounce comes from two Latin roots, nunciare, which means to announce or to message, and re, which expresses reversal. So to renounce something can mean reversing your original announcement of it. To a modern ear, you might also think about what needs to be announced again in its place. I find this fascinating, especially since we've just passed through Christmas that has the Annunciation as its core. Gabriel, a spiritual being aligned with God, announces to Mary that she will bear a son who is also God's son and who will turn the disordered and upside down world right side up again. That was the message that led to Mary's belief that the Holy Spirit would direct her life, which led to the birth and the nurture of the man whom we find in a synagogue in Capernaum today, confronting the corrupting spiritual forces that are operating even in hallowed spaces. Jesus does a couple of things in this scene from Mark that inform what our promises of renunciation are really all about. First, he confronts the corrupting spirit and does not let it possess and control the man's life anymore. Second, even though the demon tries to name Jesus for who he is, Jesus silences it, casts it out, and frees the man from its influence. Confrontation, silencing, banishment, freedom. Such are the steps for renouncing the disordered power and influence of destroying forces for the liberating, constructive power and direction of God. We first need to be able to face the demons that seek control over our life. And these days that can be a really really tough task. What are the corrupting forces that vie for your allegiance, your time, and your energy, and threaten to consume your life? 
Can you name them? I want you to take a moment now to reflect on these and to confront them. If you are truly committed to renouncing the hold that they have on your life, then the next step is silencing them. I'm not talking about silencing healthy self-reflection to flee from all doubt. I'm talking about silencing the lies that we hear and that we begin to believe which do not come from nor lead to God. Those lies can easily become distortions to healthy thoughts as they challenge the truth of our inner voice. Silencing corrupting forces means not allowing lies to dissuade you from becoming the person whom God has created you to be. With God's help, we are called to renounce. That is, to reverse the announcement of outer voices which claim that it is us versus them, which say that we are not good enough or capable enough or connected enough to experience God's goodness on this earth and in our daily lives. In baptism, we are forever freed from the hold that these falsehoods have on us. And we renounce them as a way of announcing again publicly that the only one who has a claim on our lives is Christ, the incarnate image of the love of God. It is Christ's power that banishes the corrupting spirits, the demons, the lies, whatever threatens to usurp the place of God in our lives. Christ is the one who frees us to fully become ourselves. And just like in the scene from Mark's Gospel today, the result of us claiming and living into that freedom is that Jesus' message begins to spread through us. Others witness that we are not under the prevailing sway of the crowd, but live instead by the commandments of the kingdom. Our very lives enunciate once more the alternative king to whom we give our hearts and we give our hands. In my experience, renouncing evil and its corruption is something that we need to do frequently, but in healthy ways, so that the repeated act of renouncing something doesn't end up according undue influence to it. This is why hating something or someone is actually a form of imprisonment, where the object of hate crowds out all room for God. We need to reaffirm our commitment and priorities often enough that they take root in and flourish within us, but simultaneously not overly define ourselves by anything which we seek to oppose or forsake, even for the very best of reasons. 
it is a delicate balance and as such requires God's help to strike. Ultimately, it is Christ who frees us and breaks the bonds and chains that enslave us to sin. Our job is to join with Christ through baptism and to reverse what we used to, to declare to the world. Where once we served ourselves or the powers of this world, now we serve Christ. May you renounce any hold that any other spirit may have on you this week. And remember your indissoluble connection to your maker, to your redeemer, and to the spirit of truth, which binds us all into one.
May Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always.